What's up, Daw Nation? Welcome to this episode of In The Daw, where we are gonna be walking through AU5 and Chime Song Void Walkers. Now, just so you know, down in the description, there is a free sample pack that is made from some of the sounds that AU5 created for Void Walkers. So if you want those just brutally sick sounds, link down in the description, unless you can't get to that link, in which case you can head on over to dawnation.net slash voidwalkers. By the way, if you are brand new to In The Daw, this is a series where we invite music producers like AU5 and Chime to come and break down their songs in real time. So you can actually see what are the music production strategies, techniques, tips, tricks, all that kind of stuff that is currently working in the industry. But it is important to note that this episode of In The Dot is just showing Chime's contributions to Void Walkers. If you want to see AU5's contribution to Void Walkers, then you are going to have to go check out the School of Bass, which is AU5's super intense sound design course. Not only do you get to see AU5's process with Void Walkers, but you also get to see him literally start from the beginning, from the actual inception all the way to when he sends it to Chime. Plus, there's so many other sound design tips, tricks, techniques, his entire system for showing you how to make an unlimited amount of sounds, rhythms, textures. So if you want to check out the school base, again, link down in the description. But Daw Nation, with all that said, all that out of the way, let's get into this week's episode of In The Daw with Chime. I think the amount of tracks that you have in this session is more than I had when I gave it to you. Really? <laughs> yeah, significantly yeah. more, actually. I think Holy it's about crap. twice as much. This is after I've like cleaned up the project and <laughs> this also has like hidden tracks. <laughs> Yeah, I tend to work where you can see like the top down, like when I've done something, these are muted and then I, I plonk them down. And if I want to make like a slight EQ change, I don't usually use automation. I just make a new channel. <laughs> it ends up getting pretty crazy, but I got them in folders so I can just go but like that. Oh, that's great. Starting at the beginning, right? Austin, when you sent this across, this was practically a 90% almost finished tune, would you say? I mean, I, I think it's subjective, but as far as like the arrangement goes, yeah, it was something that was playable from like start to finish. Yeah, it was about the same length probably as well, yeah. I think so. I can't remember, I think the intro when you sent it across was more like this sort of stuff. Yeah. So I put an intro to the intro on it with this business. Yeah, just starting from here, these are actually the main like chord stacks from later in the track with serum effects on. So if I take those off, it's literally just that. If I go into the serum effects, it should just be an LFO. Yeah, so it's controlling the low pass. Yeah, so it has that kind of like breezy texture and there's a bit of delay and a flanger, I suppose. We, yeah, you can kind of hear that a little bit in there. Did I go extra on the EQ? Oh, that's just coming up. Opening it. Yeah. Well, anyway, there's reverb on there. And so that creates this kind of breezy sound with the stacks. Yeah, you can hear a little bit of the, the flange in there as well. Uh, real quick, what was your process of resampling it? Resampling your original stacks? Yeah, yeah. How did you get it into a new audio track and a consolidated piece of audio without any effects? Oh, oh yeah, because I think, is it a different section? Yeah, I think it was over here. Oh yeah, yeah. So basically what I did was, here they are. I think I literally just like cut this up. Okay, gotcha. And just put it so it was just sustained across the entire thing. Cool, that makes sense. I was more so referring to like when you had the track that you have the serum effects on mm -hmm. and the automations. Yeah, that track, 88. How did you get the audio from 88 to 90? Did you bounce that out? Oh yeah, so in Logic, there's a lot of like bouncing in place, what it's called. Gotcha, that's what I was wondering about. Yeah, that's why I end up with like a million billion channels because I do something like that and I don't want any of the effects running or any of the automation running that might mess up or like you know if you have like reverb tails i just want them to stop when i press pause i've literally just set it so that b bounces that to another channel okay cool so i do that a lot you'll see it a bunch in this project cool i'm just asking because I, I used logic 9 before and i use bounce in place a lot and this is logic x i don't know if it was like the same thing or if it was a different process so cool it's pretty much the same that's what i'm gathering yeah yeah, it's nice and easy. I added a couple more layers to this, mainly this piccolo layer. Where did Mr. Piccolo come from? Where did Mr. Piccolo come from? Uh, there it is. It's hiding in the wrong spot down here. There we go. 
yeah, so I believe this is, yeah, literally just sampler. This is one of Logic's inbuilt, like... Oh, it seems to have actually, like, it can't find the piccolo I originally used. So let me try and find it. It should be in Woodwinds Piccolo. There we go. That sounds about right. And uh, then I got the same serum effects applied on there as to the other kind of breezy stacks that I processed. Yeah, so that's that. And then all together. Plus we got an impact, just a little rumbly thing here. And then we got this piano journey arpeggio coming in very gradually. This thing was made kind of later on. It was actually originally made as a layer for this bass. So if I like solo out these, you might be able to hear it very subtly in the background. Whoa. That's pretty quiet actually, but you can see, I think if I unhide this, yeah. So these are the original MIDI parts for this. And that's literally like, I just have this, is panned all the way part way to the left. This is part way to the right. So you get you get that nice like left and right business. And then I've got like this just going in the center. So that's just like a nice background texture for this bass that's doing those 16th notes. It's just got a resonator on it for almost like a bit of a lo-fi kind of feel. Is the resonator a logic effect? It's a kilohertz one. Oh, okay. Got it. Yeah. Just like a, a one note deal. Yeah. So I, I was like, I like that sound on its own. So I kind of incorporated that into the intro. I can't remember if these storm effects were part of your project or mine. I can't remember. <laughs> Might be mine. I think they were yours. I don't think I used any uh, fully. Yeah. That's just like a little bit of background noise, really. And then this fill is yours, definitely. Yeah, you can see all the like auxiliary perk. That's Austin stuff there. And then we got these tiny little blinks in the background. Crucial addition. Yeah, it's a very tiny thing. Massive. Yeah, if you're doing something as simple as this, I mean, it's, yeah, it's literally just a sine wave with, for some reason, vibrato on it. And then really the kind of magic sprinkly stuff is just this stereo delay. So yeah, so I, I've gotcha. got these stereo delays and they kind of deviated a bit off beat. So they kind of sparkle out into the distance. Yeah. And I've got one on beat as well there. But without that, just a very simple sign pluck. And uh, I'll close this before Logic has a hissy fit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, that's what I was going to say. My favorite collabs are the ones where you can hear both artists like throughout the track, like all the way through, even if it's like mostly one artist, but you can hear a bit of like background stuff from the other one. Those kind of textures end up in a lot of my collabs just because I'm trying to just sprinkle a little bit in there as a kind of reminder that, you know, this is an AO5 and Chime tune. <laughs> Here we got this beep riser thing. I think I made this in massive. Oh, here it is. Let's give it a play. Just like a, oh, I'm not touching that. Turn it off. Yeah, just a, a very simple kind of like square. Uh, and I just made sure that like those last couple of notes actually hit. I think, is that the root note F, but like way up? Yeah. Check with someone with, do you have perfect pitch? Quasi perfect pitch. <laughs> yeah. A couple notes are burned in my brain, but like, I don't recognize it as the same way that I do color, for instance. Yeah. So I could just reference them. I can imagine F being burnt into yeah. a lot of dubstep producers' brains. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's all that is really. And you'll see here an interesting technique. This is side chaining. <laughs> Excuse me? Whoa. Oh, <laughs> okay, there just fades. There's just audio fades. Yeah, so I end up doing this a lot for these kind of like breakbeat-ish things. Basically, I mean, that looks really complicated to set up, but if I wanted to, say I wanted to sidechain on every quarter note of this region, you know, I can get my scissors tool, and if I hold option, 
you can see the little plus thing and it'll make a cut for like every quarter note Whoa. which is really handy so if i wanted to apply like dubstep style like half note side chaining to this it's as simple as doing that and then make sure, making sure everything's selected i always fade in about like a hundred fade out three and then just push that like that and you've got Dude, what a workflow yeah, I've never felt like it needs to be much more precise than that. But also what I quite like about this is if something warrants a little bit less or a little bit more side chaining, like if I'm not happy with how something isn't punching through and I need like a little bit more of it coming through when there's a kick or a snare, I can literally just adjust this, push this a little bit forward or backward or the amount of fade in. And yeah, so you can see like here, there's like uh, differentiations between how much side chaining is applied each time a beat hits. So I find that helpful. I can tell a lot of people would probably cringe at that, but if it gets the job done, then it's it's getting it done. Yeah, well, I think the fact that you can just do it in just a couple mouse clicks, really, and have it be exactly how you want it versus like doing every one manually and making sure that it's the same length and same fade duration. Yeah. I think that's great because it's the most visual side chain. Yeah, I can see literally every point a beat is hitting, you know. And additionally in Logic, if I wanted to apply side chaining to multiple regions at once, say I wanted to do it to these, you can select all of those and then cut all of them at a certain rate. That's just how I've kind of ended up doing things. So we got this section now. It's just a tiny like reverse glass smashing sample there. I think I use the same sample. Really? <laughs> yeah, I use that a lot too. Reversing. Yeah, I like those. It just kind of sounds a little crystally and magical magic is a word i go to a lot with my production i'm obsessed with like twinkly sparkly stuff of course and anything that sounds like there's a mage casting spells i generally like in dubstep so this is mostly your stuff i think from this point here i might have i think i added this like filtered version of the breakbeat well, that might have been in there already, I'm not sure. We've got some chimes, of course. Yeah, we've also got like the main snare clap thing from the drop is kind of creeping in here and there. So that's that. We've got like this with a bunch of reverb and then like tape stopped so it slows down. So it kind of creates the effect of having that snare clap on there and then it becomes more of an effect than a piece of percussion. Are you using a uh, logic pitch fade for that or are you using the Killhearts tape stop? So there's an inbuilt logic thing like with the fades. I'll just show you on here. So like I can fade with the fade tool like this, but if you come in here and it's like fade out, you go to slow down. Yeah, that's it. And then it... Yeah, immediately does that. You could also do it like fade in to pitch yeah, fade up. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Let's do that. So yeah, you can speed up in. I end up using that quite a lot, actually. It's really good for like if a DJ is like scratching in a kick at the beginning of like bringing a beat in. It's super easy to do that where you can like fade this in like this. Or like reverse it as well. It's just really handy for that sort of thing. This is pretty much as it was, I think. Yeah, so I added these snare claps again to these main kick beats. So you'll see like for each time the snare clap hits, it's on the same beat as the kicks that are on this channel. And that's because the kicks that are on this channel are brighter. You can see that the building kick there, yeah, is filtered down. So you get a really nice transient that I've already kind of shaped for the drop between that kick hitting and that snare clap hitting. Pretty simple stuff, really. My sort of main addition to the drop, which are these like blinker sounds. Yeah, so you'll recognize this from the drop over here. Yeah. Yeah, so these things, let's open up these. Tell me about the blinkers, man. <laughs> I, can't, I can't get enough of the blinkers. Use them when you want to change lanes. Here we go. So I do a lot of mousing stuff in with MIDI. So often what I'll do is if I wanted to make one of these kind of very rapid multiple note MIDI situations, I would go in here and like create a sequence 
whatever there there and then <laughs> and then i'll just time stretch it as if i'm time stretching audio you can make it really fast <laughs> or much slower yeah you know i can set out a pattern of that or whatever and then just merge those together and all the MIDI is kind of like in the spot that I want it at. So the trick to making that type of sound is to get your original sound and then have it playing a bunch of notes, either going up the scale or going down the scale really quickly. And that's what creates that type of tone. Is that what I'm hearing? Basically, yeah. You'll see in Massive, I think I've done absolutely nothing to this other than I'm just receiving a square wave from this. I mean, if I was to play this, it's just a square wave. I think possibly Dimension Expander. Yeah, so I exported those to audio because you can see that the way I've made this stereo is just by doing the old left and right trick and then delaying one of them. So that's really good for just getting like super wide, but then you've got a situation where you're like leaning one way over the other because usually whatever's playing first is more prominent. So I literally just took this and each time one of these plays, it actually just swaps left and right. So you have it bouncing slightly to the uh... left and right each time. Yeah, so you don't end up leaning half to one side trying to listen to this thing. And then we've got ooh, Valhalla. <laughs> yeah, I guess even more stereo stuff, uh, a bit of OTT and yeah, a bit of uh, reverb on that. So I think I can turn it on, but not open it. Apparently, yes. So that's just like a very prominent like room verb and I'll often put like reverb on and then OTT afterwards because you get the kind of added compression on top that makes the reverb tail pop out a lot more. During the build, I believe this thing pitches up. Let's see. Yeah. So that pitches up. <laughs> oh, I must have pitched this up just with transposing, I think. So you can see with these individual regions looking up here, I'm just transposing each of them up one each time. Nice. Because then you get cleaner transposition between each one instead of using like a pitch bend thing, which I found often if you automate a pitch bend from like a, an auxiliary plugin, it usually like puts stuff like weirdly out of time sometimes and it just kind of struggles. Yeah, so I just use the transpose for that and then yeah, I've got an increasingly decaying reverb up into the drop. The cool thing about Valhalla delays, like Valhalla reverb delays, is that they don't change in pitch when you change the decay time, like a lot of yeah. reverbs do. Or rather, I guess it would be the reverb size is what is the thing that changes the pitch of whatever's in the diffusion buffer. Yeah, I, I really like that. It's just the smoothest. I use the vintage one. I, I don't know. That's just the one I have. It's the best one, I think. Yeah, it's, it's most it just, capable. I've found it's really nice. It's really nice. You just like put it on basically any melodic content whatsoever and just like crank it way up on the decay and you've got like an ambient tune, which yeah. I really like. Totally. <laughs> okay, yes. So I guess drums wise, I think you, you had very similar drums in that you, you did have a clap snare rather than like a regular snare. Like yeah, it didn't sound nearly as good as yours. Same pattern though. So often, like you'll hear on this uh, kick channel, you'll hear a different sample for when the kick's playing on its own and when the kick's playing with the snare clap. Mm. Very subtle. Yeah. One sounds a little bit more dispersed. It's actually just like uh, this shelf comes down a little bit. Oh. And yeah, I'm just basically sort of preparing the kicks that hit at the same time as the snare claps to be a little bit further out of the way in terms of high end. Yeah, that allows it to really smash on this one without sounding way overpowered in comparison to the kick just on its own. So this snare clap on its own sounds like this. That's just one of my snare clap samples and that's really made from just the top end of a regular snare and then i've also i think duplicated it and then pitched it down a bit so you get these kind of nice low end but not thumpy like the usual 200 hertz kind of stuff mm -hmm. like, so you get that that's not going to get in the way of the kick like a usual like snare thump would yeah and then we've got yeah, just an extra layer. And you can see I've actually cut off the transient on that one. So we just have the transient from this one. And uh, yeah, that's just a little bit kind of shinier because it's got like a pitched up crash in it. And together it sounds quite nice and thick. 
Uh, so that's basically the changes I made to the drums for this section. We went over these blinkers already, but there's also a variation. All this comes from the, the resonator, which weirdly is like off the note. I don't know why. So when it's like bang on the note, it didn't sound how I wanted it. And I was just kind of playing with very slight changes in the pitch and it just kind of sounded a lot better about there. Yeah, and it like accentuates different harmonics. Yeah, exactly. Like that almost feels detuned weirdly. So yeah, so that's how that ended up sounding like that. You'll see as well here. So I've got like half note side chain. So <laughs> this is more weird side chaining stuff that I do. I do use a volume <laughs> that also <Bing>. needs. <laughs> how do you determine whether to do the first method of side chaining versus the volume shaper method? So with, yeah, with volume shaper, you can connect it to MIDI and logic, but it's really finicky the way it, it does it. I found that I just don't have as much control because I can't show you my curve because I can't open the the thing. But basically what I like, you know how I faded out like by three when I was doing the manual like fades? What I quite like is having a portion of complete silence before each next transient. And I found like during mastering that really helps because instead of having this wall of sound come all the way up to the next transient that we're hitting, it has just a moment to like readjust and then hit that transient and not like add any distortion we don't want, that sort of thing. That's literally just set, that volume shaper is just set to half notes. You'll see quarter notes because later on the second drop goes to like a four on the floor beat. So it's literally just ease of use. And then if I have something like that break beat that isn't consistently needing side chaining on like a quarter note or a half note, I'll go in and just like manually do it with fades. Convoluted probably, but that's the way I've kind of just figured out how to do it. So yeah, this main bass here, let's see, where's the MIDI for this? There it is. This thing is Serum. First use of Serum <laughs> in this project file. <laughs> I was going to ask about that. Yeah, so here it is. I mean, you had Serum effects, but yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, I suppose. So yeah, a lot of this is just coming from this crazy flange filter. That's really it. I mean, this LFO is controlling the sync on this. I guess, have I got noise? Got a little bit of noise on there. But yeah, really, most of the sound comes from the flange and then probably, yeah, some... Oh, not distortion. Yeah, just the multiband compression. Yeah, I just really like those, like, pretty pure tones you can get with um, the flange filters and just finding, like, the right spot. You'll notice if I budge this, like, a tiny bit off, it just sounds bad. Ooh, sounds cool. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's pretty sweet. <laughs> yeah, but, like, if I want this to sit exactly where I want it. I use the old holding shift technique. Yeah, you can kind of move this in smaller increments. So you can hear how that's like the sweet spot almost. Ooh, but mm. yeah, if you want something more discordant. Yeah, I'm coming back to the sound. So you're tuning it by ear though? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, basically. I mean, yeah, this LFO is controlling it, but it comes to a complete stop, so. Yeah, I'll just find the spot that I like. Yeah, definitely come back to this sound because it's cool. <laughs> I haven't used it since this, so. Yeah, oh, and you can see there's a variation here for later on. I believe yeah. it's the same note, but maybe I changed the sync position? Yeah, I think the sync goes a little higher, and then I readjust it in the same way uh, to get that really nice, like, why aren't you playing, mate? What are you playing at? Yeah, to get that nice squeaky thing going on. Yeah, so that with a bunch of reverb becomes this. And there's a touch of, are you going to open? Okay. There it is. <laughs> it's just a bit of uh, isotope trash for distortion, just to make it a, a little less clean, a little bit more gritty to fit in with the bases that are about to follow. Yeah, let me see if there's anything else. Yeah, there's a tiny bit of the stack. Yeah, so that was yours, Austin, just like the original, whatever we had on this before I, I changed it, had that in there as well. Yeah, so that's that. Mostly, like, when I work on tunes like this, I let what's already there do the work, and then I just kind of try and accent things and pick out little pieces where I can add a little bit of, like, color or fun stuff. 
with the blinkers, like before I added these. Yeah, I just had this big old bases. Big old bait sausage. So that's all Austin stuff. And I quite liked how you have like that growl that's just kind of and then you also have the I really like those kind of, I guess it's a polymeter. It would be basically two rhythms happening at the same time. Yeah, yeah. It's a dotted dotted eighth note rhythm that restarts every half note. Dun, dun, dun. But I mean, there's more articulations in it, but yeah. But yeah, I like, the, I like the fact that you can tune your ear into one rhythm or the other. So you yeah. can tune it into the growl and just go for the... Or you can tune into the... That thing. Right. So I thought accentuating that with another sound would make those sounds separate a little bit more mm -hmm. and you could like tune into one or the other. So adding this really like brought that out because it's more of a tonal sound and it just cut through everything. Yeah, so then we get to this sort of thing. Obviously inspired by xylan i often call these either complexes or xylanters literally because <laughs> that's kind of like he's the first person to do that within dubstep i feel i guess it came from like complextro maybe where you have these really quick like sudden switches in timbre i don't know where it really came from but xylan's definitely the first i feel to use it in this context yeah he's the first one that i've heard to do that yeah. kind of sound too you have something and it's playing a melody but each note of the melody is a different sound is that what i'm hearing Practically, yeah. Anything I call a complexer is basically these very, you know, you have these very quick changes between different sounds. That, that's all it, all it really is. Mm, In this okay. case, each of these does have a, a note that's playing. So yeah, so you will get a sense that there is a melody there. So we've got this one little piece of Austin's bass. Yeah, just that octave up F. And then we've got what seems to be a very simple like bit crushed thing here but yeah literally just square wave with a saw on top and it's up a fifth yeah with some down sampling so we got that and then yeah literally just a square wave with bit crush on uh this is actually a sound font the same sound font used in sap machine by port robinson i recognize that one yeah uh how does it go da -da -da. Uh, <laughs> uh. <laughs> What's the name of that sound font? It's from the general MIDI pack, which was used, I think, for the N64, PlayStation 1, a bunch, like a bunch of games around there. It's just called Brightness. Brightness, that's it. Yeah, I remember that one. I get particularly nostalgic for that one because I know it from certain games like Rayman 1. Yeah. <laughs> used that a ton. Yeah, and uh, a bunch of other games probably. Rayman. And then we got some choirs, I think. Yeah, well, let me see here. Yeah, a little choir texture I made. And that's literally just a logic inbuilt choir. It looks like I just pitched it up for this second part. Yeah, pitched it up like an octave. Or oh, I might have flex timed it. Yeah, I've just like sped it up 200% so it moves up an octave. And then we got this icicle lead sound with Bit Crush on. Don't know if I have the original bits of this. I don't. You better. You better. Oh, Frank. <laughs> Still breaker. I'll recreate it right now. Oh, thank goodness. If I go in... Hello. There we go. Let me get to my stuff. Here it is. Leads. That's very loud. Okay, it's in my sample pack. Hey. There it is. Oh, what a nice mm. pluck, dude. Yeah, I call it the icicle pluck because it sounds like you're in an icy cave or something. So it's literally just that, I believe, with a bit of bit crush on. I really like the logic bit crusher. That's it. Something like that, I think. So that's <laughs> that's what that is. Yeah, so all together you have this kind of yeah, very quick flurry of different sounds. And yeah, I just love that sort of thing. I also like offsetting them by like tiny amounts and seeing how that sounds so you can see how that would you can just come up with different patterns like that very easily text tab 
So this thing is a more complex serum patch, I think. So let's look into here. So flange filter again, <laughs> if I take that off. We just have like changing the timbre a little bit. Uh, I like doing these kind of stepped LFOs where, you know, every time there's a stab, it rapidly changes and then you can apply it to a bunch of different things, especially the like flange filter. And yeah, you get it changing the sound drastically like every millisecond. <laughs> yeah, so you've got that. And that's, that's controlling the flange, it's controlling the sync on this. It's controlling anything else. Oh, this still EQ peak. Oh, the EQ peak as well. Yeah, so like if I took those off. That's just like a little bit more movement. And then this, I believe. Yeah, so the LFO2 here is controlling the amplitude and the... Yeah, this uh, low pass filter. So it makes it more controlled. You can see if I took that off. It's just completely opened out. But that keeps it stabby. And what I like about these kind of things is that you can literally just take with these two LFOs, use the same bass sound, but change a bunch of stuff. So yeah, I could change this to like quarter notes or I could change it to more of like a wobble. I'll do something like that, or even faster. And then you get something bubbly going on. That's that sound. And then what's this? Ah, oh, that's a variation I think I used. And then what I did was I took both of those, bounced them to audio, and I cut them up into a new pattern. So the, just a quick question. So the, the patch that's on 170 is the same patch that's on 169, just with slightly tweaked parameters. Is that what I'm hearing? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think I just, yeah, I got a resonator on here. On E, apparently. Okay. And then you'll see over here, you can see it kind of like completes the phrase that was there before. And then this is layered with a couple more things. Oh, there was a little bit of isotope trash, just distortion on there and then we've got the piano i feel like this was higher in the mix yeah so that just adds that kind of like magical <laughs> backing to it and then i got this kind of cruddy bass pluck just to uh, accentuate the transients a little bit uh, yeah and you end up with that sort of thing Yeah, this thing, this is just more layering with Austin's bases. So that's already a really nice growl with an obvious like harmonic above it. And I just wanted to accentuate that even further. So it almost felt like a chord. What is a scraggy boy we got going on? <laughs> yeah, um, this thing is massive, I think. Yeah. So this thing... Oh, and they're panned left and right as well. Let's see, we've got square, sign. It's one of those typical, like, two octaves up, two octaves down, scream filter things. Must I use this kind of sound, like, back in the day, a bunch. But this has got a bunch of chorus on it, so, like... Uh -huh. Yeah, that sort of thing. And then you've just got it pitching up with the envelope. Yeah, without the scream, it just... Sounds a bit weird. One on the root note, one on the harmonic. Yeah, and I just kind of dialed that in enough so you get a sense of it. And additionally, we have the choir from oh, earlier, baby. just for like an extra layer. And then more complex stuff, which is basically the same stuff, I think. Yeah, except we've got this little wob from Austin. Yeah, so I think that's exactly the same as that. Ah, yeah, I just changed some of the notes around on the MIDI for that, so it's just a slight variation on it. There's a variation, I think. And that's the same again. It's that scraggy thing, but I've got it slowing down out like I showed you before with the logic inbuilt thing. 
that growl, dude. Right, well, you say that growl, but it's basically your growl, mate. Like, <laughs> this thing, I, I literally found your hyper growl tutorial, and this is the first thing I made with it. Hacking the system. It's, yeah, it's literally... <laughs> This, yeah, this is the first thing that came out. I was just following I never it step it by step. Like that. No, you did something else. <laughs> did you no, do? No. Okay, look. <laughs> this is how identical it is, right? So I've got the wavetable position moving. I did the resampling of the was it square? Yeah. Um, did that resample thing that I've never used before. Before I saw that tutorial, <laughs> made this. Did the high pass with the resonance peak. Did the LFO the same as you did. And then, yeah, we, I did the bend plus exactly how you did. And then did some EQing, a little bit of movement on there. D dimension expander, a little bit of flange, exactly like you did. <laughs> bit of chorus, I think static chorus, is it? No, no, yeah. it's not. Yeah, it is. Wait, yeah. Uh, it's just crazy though, because it's got like this like, kind of like yeah. angriness to well, let's, it. Let's see what it sounds like without... That's what it sounds like on its own. Which, I mean, is pretty rough. <laughs> and then a bit of EQ movement. A little bit more grit coming from that. And then a lot of it comes from the chorus, I think, and then the compressor. And then distortion? I think it's the chorus and the initial high pass filter that you, you tuned that perfectly. Oh. And it yeah. gave it that, like, bite. Yeah, this is another one of those, like, just trying to find the sweet spot deals where, like... Mm -hmm. You can make it really squeak down there, or... You can get it crazy up there. I think it was about... It's about there, it sounds. Yeah, about there. And then I think I got a bit of Resonator, which just adds that metallic, nasty stuff. Ooh. Yeah, it's on A sharp. That, that um, resonator, dude. Resonator is a, a good time. If I put this on F with a root note, just kind of accentuates the sub a bit. Uh, let's try C. Or like F2. I was just like, okay, A sharp it is. Awesome. For For someone to achieve what the resonator is doing right here in another DAW like Ableton, what would you recommend them to use? I would use the same plugin because that's a third party plugin. Oh, it is right? a third party. Oh, okay. It's Killhearts Resonator. Oh, yeah, yeah. Kilohertz. Never mind. It's, but stupid. in Ableton, you could use you could use the resonator effect in Ableton that's built in. The original resonator, not the spectral resonator. No. no if you if you want the sound of the Ableton resonator as well, the Ableton resonator you can tune to like a bunch of different notes and make chords out of. And that's what Asaur has been using a bunch. But like he actually put in a sample pack, if you go to convolution impulses. Oh, he's nice. done all of his resonator impulses in here. If you use a convolution reverb and just plug one of these in, it's going to sound all asaurery. And then obviously you can like... Let's get an F minor actually. F minor there. Yeah, and then you get... Yeah, which is that super man. useful if you don't have Ableton's Resonator because he's done like every chord dude. on the planet as well. All the chords, dude. I'm curious, what do those individual impulse responses sound like? Oh. Dry. Like... Oh, interesting. Just okay. that sort of thing. I think what he did was he took the impulse that you used in your Convolution Reverb tutorial on mm -hmm. making crazy effects just took that and then just like maxed out the resonator on these different chords got it and then yeah you can effectively apply that to anything with the uh, convolution reverb variation there is that just moving parameters around or is that a whole new hyper growl i think this is literally just a different note ah mm -hmm. i think so yeah sometimes you need to like move things around when you're changing the notes like i might have needed to change where this was sitting so that it's kind of honking in the same way. Yeah, yeah, that's what was there before. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and then I added a couple of layers to these stacks, I think. So this is... Yeah, so that's the bass Ooh. part. That's yours. 
Oh, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, how did you make that? What genius made that? <laughs> So how I made that was, <laughs> um, okay, I got some chiptune stuff, very subtle in the background. Uh, that's pretty much just whatever this is, let's see, probably massive. Just a uh, hard pan left and right and uh, a stepper doing the, the pitch. Very simple, like, octave arpeggiated thing. And I've also got that, which accentuates the tone on this. So you get this kind of weird chorusy thing going on. It's very subtle. It just helps that particular harmonic cut through a little bit more. And then you got these super saws from Austin. Yeah, and I think everything else is yours there, apart from like complexes I showed you already. And the little blinkers. Oh yeah, and the blinkers. Yeah, I've changed the, the MIDI there just to fit with the chord sequence, so... Very slight change on the notes on that again. This bit was really tough to mix because, uh, I mean, you'd already done a lot of the job because you had the, like, re really thick, like, wobs and stacks and oh, yeah. um, the lead on top of that as well. It's too much. <laughs> it was a lot, but I mean, and then I added more layers, so. So that's your lead. And then I kind of wobbified these, I think. I was kind of going for like, you know, Gemini from back in the day? Oh yeah, oh yeah. That kind of thing, like where mm -hmm. he would have that kind of thing going on. Oh yeah, I love that. Very influential. And actually, I've made like a wob out of a piano texture here. That's in there? Uh, what? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, you can kind of hear that. Let me find the original thing here. Yeah, so I just added a little bit more like harmonic flavor to this. And again, this is just serum effects. Kind of a cruddy piano, but yeah, with the serum effects, doing some wobbing. Wobbing. It just kind of sits in there as if it's part of the the full sound. Ooh, something's wobbing in a weird way there. Yeah, I just got some noise as well, just to add to the sort of fizz of that that we lost from playing the low pass filter to these stacks. And then we've also got this thing. Yeah, so this is a ghostly vocal from Splice, and then I put a bunch of reverb on it and just took the reverb tail and looped it. In fact, yeah, here it is. And then the same serum effects on. So it just adds to the, the texture of everything else that's going on. Here, I got some of those complexes coming in again, just peppering in there. And then I think I wobbified one of your bases even more. Uh, yeah, I think so. Let me just put this onto there. Yeah, so I just used nice. a bandpass and I guess some of the hyper from the hyper dimension. So that's what Whoa. it was like before. It's very loud because I've bandpassed it. Yeah, but I just made that a little more. Wobby. <laughs> this uh, harmony that I added. I was going to ask about that. With this being like quite a signature, like AU5 lead, I was like, right, I'm going to do a harmony with my signature chime lead. Yeah. Because yeah, then you've got that cool, boss. like both of these producers, uh, I can hear them all right now in my brain. So... <laughs> There's the MIDI for it. Let me just join that up. So I tried to, I think first of all, I just mimicked what you had with your lead. And then I figured out where I wanted the harmony to sit above. And then do like mm. a crazy note at the top there. And this thing, if I carefully, 
This is my uh, lead I use. I've been using for like probably like seven years, and it's literally just square wave on this and the woody wavetable from Massive and a bit of vibrato. Like that's all it is, <laughs> and it just kind of sounds like me. And then yeah, I put some distortion on that to kind of compete with because this is pretty distorted as it is. Yeah, I wanted to make sure it could kind of compete with that. Yeah, and then all together, I, I somehow managed to fit like all of that other stuff in with that sitting on top. Oh, it's still playing, hold on. Somehow it all really fits together well and you can hear everything distinctly separated. I know. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure how <laughs> we managed that. So this section is pretty close to how it originally was, I think. I just kind of, it's another one of those just kind of embellishing it with chimey bits and pieces. So like I've got the piano journey up back in there little impact thing and then the riser from before and you recognize that vocally wob from what was layered earlier mm. i kind of try and reuse sounds a bunch throughout a track because you get kind of a more seamless flow it all kind of feels like the same track all the way through because you're having these kind of recurring pieces come back occasionally i think here i did a bunch of drum work was this the original i think so yeah might be yeah i think this is what we originally had and maybe your original kick And uh, yeah, I felt like just beefing this section up a bunch more than where it was at. So yeah, we got all these other layers in here. You see there's a layer there just to boost the transient. Oh uh, yeah. Just that tiny click. Yeah. Without. With very tiny difference. And then I've actually got parallel distortion as well. I find with these kind of like break beaty beats, a bit of parallel distortion really helps to glue everything together because you're using all these different samples and you've also got like a kick and a snare both from kind of different places and you want it to sound like almost one drum kit even if it's electronic. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I tend to use parallel distortion for that. Sounds really good. Yeah, so the other layers we have in here got like a ghost snare which is just the same snare, but a bit quieter. And then we got a nice mm. break beat from Splice. And I think this is actually a Sultan sample that I slowed down a bunch. Mm, that's nice. Chuggers. Chugger, chugger. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that's that. And then there's a few variations, I believe. Um, if I just solo all the drums over here. Yeah, so I think that's your fill, yeah. But I kind of messed around with the timing of it and added this kind of flangey snare. Yeah, so this mm. thing... Oops. I think that's our snare from the B section of the drop. And then it's got this uh, mega verb thing that already has flange on it. So you get that nice big snare out of nowhere thing. And then, yeah, I just messed around with the, the positioning of that to fill that in. But that's really the drums for this section. And let's see what else I did. Yeah, so I got a, a just like a backup pluck for what was already there, which is this stuff. Because I, I knew I was kind of trying to elevate the energy a little bit further than where it was. And by adding a bunch of layers to the drums, this kind of softer bass wasn't cutting it after I'd made the changes. Like if I mute this. 
it's it's nice, but it's just kind of in the background, so it needed this other kind of crispy layer to pop out a bit more. Oh yeah, very subtle, and yeah, we we got this little fill here. So this thing is as simple as yeah, it was part of that complexer earlier. It's just a square wave with bit crush. And then that note leads into the harmonic on this sound. <laughs> kind of. It kind of it creates a chord. Oh, and you can see here, this is an example of where I've changed the side chaining so that this pops through a little bit more. Yeah. So like if I applied my usual side chaining to this, let's hear what that would sound like. You can feel it ducking out of the way. Yeah, and the last note gets lost. So it's a little bit more subtle. You get the full picture of that sound without it getting in the way of the drums. I think this thing got moved. I don't know. Yeah, second build, same as the first at the moment. And then it changes a bit on this. Oh, I've also got a little... Oh, that was from the original, that snare roll thing. Da -da -da -da. Yeah, this is the change. Yes. Mm. Builds are kind of the most formulaic part of dance music, I find. So it can be really difficult to make a build interesting because it's got to do the job of a build, which is always building. <laughs> if a build's really expected, you want it to be expected to some degree. You want it to build to a point and then drop because that's kind of the satisfying thing. But to add these little bits in between that make it not just like a copy and paste, I try to do on each of my tracks where the builds differ at least a little bit. So this thing, Let's see. So that's, yeah, let's just cut up what you had. And then I think this is the same. Yeah, that's already building how we want it. But then I just pitched these up. I think again with just the transpose feature. Yeah. And I, I might have had that on beat originally. So maybe it was like this. Or something like that. Oh, I didn't realize it was offset like that. Yeah. Yeah, I really liked how that sounded offset. Because that does the job, but this just makes it extra, extra hype. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You took this whole section and cut it up too. Like originally it was just a straight build with just me applying a frequency shifter to everything. Oh, right. You gave it that d -d 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 rhythm. Yeah, yeah. That wasn't like that before. Yeah, I kind of wanted to proceed that pattern that was going to happen on the drop, the and the, the syncopated pattern. So having that thing come in that's something i do a lot where i'm like previewing what the bass is going to mm -hmm. sound like in the drop it was like this when i got here um Ex except the blinkers <laughs> ah. so again it's just a situation of me embellishing what was already there and adding these little complexy bits Yeah, and then you've got like the same sort of fill from that breakbeat section. And it follows exactly the same pattern as the first drop with the resonant one coming next. So this needed changing a fair bit from when this happened in halftime over here, because you'll notice the patterns are different. I tried just like copy and pasting and like just trying that with quarter notes this time, but it just sounded a bit like I'd copied and pasted it. And yeah, <laughs> so I wanted to change it to something more fitting to the new rhythm we were dealing with. So we got another hyper growl thing, which is basically the same patch as before, two different variations of that. And there, yeah, I just pitched up the choir from the complexer. Yeah. 
And then finally, we got this section and I didn't want this to be exactly the same as it was before. So the difference I decided to make, I didn't want to change the melody because that was already pretty set in stone. So I just changed the LFO patterns of the, all the wobbly stuff in the background, really. Oh, and I put this little sort of fake out thing in to add even more variation into that and also help the transition from quarter notes back into halftime. You've got this kind of pause where you can go, okay, we've come out of that now and now something else is happening. So this is the same as before. That's the same as before, but with slightly different LFO pattern. And almost at the end, really. And we were working on this, and we were both talking about the last drop, and you changed up the LFO pattern on the chords. Mm. I see you have on your tracks, yeah, stacks, wob, quarter, and half. Oh, yeah, yeah, I think. yeah. Oh, eighth and, eighth and quarter. Yeah, so it's the same serum effects applied, but I've just put it onto another channel. So what I can do is just change the pattern by just dragging oh, it from one to the other. That's so much cleaner than trying to like the, do yeah, the trying LFO to automate automation. <laughs> yeah, because then you LFO can get like off set and stuff. Basically, I don't like automation. <laughs> Mm -hmm. It can get really messy and then it's like another realm. It's like a parallel dimension of stress just added on top of <laughs> what you've already yeah. got in your project. Especially if they get stuck, then you're just like, <laughs> yeah. scrub through the whole song and exactly. replay it. Yeah, I know. And you, you, you have to go like, oh, what went wrong there? And then you have to go back and find it. If I can avoid automation, I generally try to. Mm -hmm. And you'll see when I do automate things, I then put it into audio and then hide mm -hmm. the automation so i don't have to deal with it or mess it up or anything yeah so that's just an easy way of doing it yeah so i just did that for the stacks the piano wob as well yeah see i did that thing with midi and then got it into audio yeah and uh, probably that other vocal wobbly thing is the same deal And then the final thing at the end, I'm not sure what you originally had at the end. I think it was just an impact on the downbeat. I don't think there was anything at the end. Yeah, so. Yeah, so I really like hanging on that final chord and then just kind of filtering it to a close. So let's see what I did here. <laughs> yeah, so this lead then gets reversed. And then does that little slow down thing. Then the harmony lead. Ah, there's like a little additional harmony in there. It just goes. Da -da -da. Yeah. And then does this kind of like rising thing. And this, yeah, I just liked that kind of like cascade at the end. Yeah. And then what else did I do? Stacks, breeze, outro. Yeah, so that's literally from the very beginning of the track, one of these. I think I just took that, bounced it in place, reversed it, and yeah, did a little automation on here. Yeah, and it all kinds of, kind of adds up, because if you're doing that with multiple layers, and also I think I made the automation for them filtering out very slightly different from each other, so it didn't sound like I just bounced everything down and filtered it. It all kind of feels a little bit natural as it comes to a close. On this reverse chimes as well. Yeah, and then you've got the Xbox logo or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, not get, let's not get political here let's, let's keep this G -rated. i think I, I did notice like over here in the project this was originally maybe what the b section sounded like when you sent it over oh i forgot all about that so I think that's what I ended up replacing with the where they called. 
The chuggers. The chuggers. <laughs> the chuggers. No, the blinkers. I knew I needed more of a upfront chime bass sound in there somewhere. Yeah. Rather than something that's just like embellishing it. So I think that's why that got replaced with that. I know. That was a good call because that section was just crazy and random. Yeah. I, th I might have taken some bits of that out to put into like the complexer patterns or something but is there anything that you would have done that, that you've learned since then you're like oh man if i would have known this at that time oh that would have been so cool to apply here do you have anything like that i think if this had been made later i would have done a lot more convolution reverb stuff because that's what i'm obsessed with at the moment but no i i don't think i would change much really same with you austin <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to think <laughs> probably a lot of stuff yeah Oh, really? Um, as far as specific things, I, I, I don't know. Probably mostly like just being more optimized with my workflow, using newer techniques and newer racks that I've used. So I'm not just like redundantly. And also at this point, I would have had Ableton 10. I think I was actually still using Ableton 9 back then. So do you got any tips and tricks for producers that are collaborating with other people that's across two different DAWs? Like obviously Austin use Ableton, Chime use Logic. Got any tips and tricks for that? Because I, I can foresee that getting real difficult real quick. There's the technical side and then there's the like the conceptual side. Because we kind of have similar approaches when it comes to collaborations. I'm not really a fan of like, okay, this section is obviously this artist. And then this section is obviously the other artist. I think yeah. a collaboration should really be like a pretty homogenized blend of sounds and concepts and yeah, just both of the artists throughout. Mm -hmm. Some shining more than others, like they're taking turns, but the whole thing doesn't feel like, okay, they just took two separate songs from individual artists and then did a mashup, which this doesn't. Like this is, sounds thorough. Yeah, you could get that from a mix, like a DJ exactly. just mixing two different tunes. But when it's this integrated, yeah, I, I agree completely. Like that's what's exciting to me about a collab is diving into it and really like, picking apart okay i think the snare was probably this guy or, or whatever right yeah and having it quite difficult to figure out um, almost who did what because it's so meshed together yeah yeah i'd say on the technical side sending clean stems is so important because i know on ableton you can basically just batch send everything right there's like a setting for that yeah. yeah there's quite a bit of things that you can do configurations that you can do when rendering stems there's an option that lets you render selected tracks only and that could be individual tracks that can be groups yeah group tracks and you have the option to include return tracks in the mix mm. so you can include the return and master effects in your individual stems don't really know how it does that yeah. on the back end, but that is an option. What I try doing is I'll use a sidechain bus, which is a send that all of the groups that I, all of the tracks that I want to sidechain, I'll send it to that. And what that'll do is I'll still be able to bounce out individual tracks or individual groups, but it will include anything that's on the sidechain bus as far as effects go mm. in the render of each one of those. So when you recombine them, you'll get the sidechain just how it sounds in the master pretty much. Usually when you're asking for stems, you know, I'll always check, do you want side chaining or, or not? So for that, you basically have both from the way you're sending it, which yeah. is really helpful because side chaining isn't necessarily like a cut and dry thing. People do different side chaining things and that fits well with how they arrange stuff. And Yeah, absolutely. If you want to change the beat, you know, you're kind of at the mercy of volume dips where the original beat was. Uh, yeah, generally ask up top, do, do you want side chaining or not? And yeah, I'd say my, my favorite stems to receive are they're numbered in the order that they would be in their original project. They're named things that you can understand <laughs> and you can drag and drop them in, give or take the side chaining. It will sound exactly like it does on their end. That's my gold standard for stems. And there isn't like a hundred million thousand. So like if I was sending the stems for this project, all of these bases pretty much apart from I would separate the sub out and anything that was on top of each other. So like the blinkers I would probably put as a separate base channel that could probably be two or three channels instead of like a hundred <laughs> that I've used totally. here. So yeah, se sending stems like that is brilliant. But yeah, the reason why I asked about the Ableton thing is because I've received some stems that are just like, they've just gone brrr, just done the automated thing and just sent it to me. Mm. So there's like 48 channels that are complete silence and yeah. there's, all the groups as well as the individual right. channels. So if you play it, it's just an absolute mess because some of the groups are like way louder and also they're stacking on top of what is already there. It might be like a pain to go through and really like think about how you're exporting things and making sure things aren't 
on top of each other that might want to be separated but appreciated when you receive stems like that so that would be my like main tip totally yeah the worst thing is going through tracks and you realize like there are three tracks that have the same instruments in it but like one is dry one has the effects on it and then one is like the bus of that That's yeah yeah too much i don't and then know you have to figure out what they used or not out of those three channels <laughs> and then you have to basically remix their track for yeah oh <laughs> it's just totally. super complicated the other thing that i wanted to mention is you don't want the master effects like a multiband compressor and like a clipper on everything too because that'll mess it up that's the other thing i get a lot is where the stems are all just like bricks just brick waveforms and it's like Okay, but if everything's normalized, then everything's going to be normalized at a different a different volume as well. And again, you have to remix down the entire thing. So, so my my suggestion for that to prevent that from happening, because right, normalize. You don't want your tracks to be super quiet, and you don't want them to be like going over zero or clipping. Nor do you want them to be normalized because that'll mess up the gain relationship between tracks. What I discovered is the best of all those worlds is just render at thirty two bit. Because you can go over zero decibels and it won't clip. You can reduce that without it. And you, you oh. have more dynamic range over zero dB if you're rendering at 32-bit float. Interesting. I'm pretty sure that's yeah. what I sent these as. Oh, okay. Do you know if there's any difference in terms of like 24 and 16 for rendering out waves or... So the difference isn't in both 24 and 16. If you go over zero, you're clipping regardless. 24 is just higher resolution than six, like significantly higher resolution than 16. So for instance, if you have like individual instrument tracks that are really quiet and not normalized, if you render them at 16 and then, you know, the collaborator turns them up, there's probably going to be like quantization noise. So generally, yeah, render is... at 24 or 32 where yeah. possible. Well, I've learned something there because I've probably been rendering at 16. <laughs> I mean, it saves on space tremendously. Yeah. The noise, I mean, eventually will add up. Or if, if you're compressing something that is really quiet, it's going to introduce some distortion. Yeah, I think probably most people and most, I mean, I've been producing for I don't know how long. I probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference, but Same. cumulatively, that's something that might cause an issue, I guess. Yeah. Possibly. <laughs> 16-bit is really the best for like the final mastered version of the thing. Before then, I don't think anything should be 16-bit. It's not necessary. Gotcha. Yeah. Cool. I'll do that from now on. <laughs> so at the very bottom, I, I didn't even realize this, you have a sub layer. And I don't think we talked about that at all, what you're using oh, for your sub yeah, base. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have the sub just on, on your base. Yeah, baked in almost. Um, yeah. So is that just like the sub from Serum and you've just kind of compressed like the low end on that so that it stays kind of the same volume or? So that's usually my workflow. If the sub like perceptively sounds clean coming out of the synth, then I'll just preserve that and then maybe put like a sub band limiter or sub band compressor mm. on, on the whole bass group just so it's steady. But sometimes what I do, if, this, if the sub sounds messy coming out of the synth, I'll low cut it to high pass it. And then I'll have a sub layer, but I'll have them as an instrument in Ableton. You can have instrument racks, which is basically just like, you know, one track that has multiple instruments. Yeah. So I'll have a sub layer for that because usually what I'll do is saturate it or process both of those later ah, and kind of glue yeah, them together. Yeah. Have, I used very long time ago when I was using Logic as well, I, I used a sub bass track, but I just got out of the habit of that. Just, I don't know, yeah, it felt yeah. more flexible, but I'm curious as to what you're using and how, like, what waveform you're using I'm for doing sub. exactly, yeah, what you said you used to do, which is basically, yeah, separate sub, and it's just in massive, and it's just, I mean, this is what it sounds like if I just, like, play that a bunch. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's basically just a sine wave and tiny bit of harmonics coming through from a smooth square, and then just cutting off the, like, kind of ramping this off here. Yeah. Are you doing anything with the phase? Like, are you changing the phase of the oscillators at all? Or just keeping it? Just keeping it exactly how that is. And then cool. I'll just, yeah, I'll just cut the low end off anything that I'm putting it under. Yeah. That tends to work for me. Nice. Um, but yeah, obviously having it baked in there, like your bass sounds sound a lot more natural and like the whole thing has been created in the same universe uh, that is something that can be an issue if you use the separate sub and you don't like glue them together correctly with eq is that they can feel completely separate that's right yeah in a live setting though it doesn't sound as as bad i feel like when it's played really loud through speakers it kind of naturally glues it together in a pleasing way yeah yeah exactly but what i'll often do is like on my 
master channel is just like listen to just the low end. Oh yeah. And it generally sounds okay, but you can tell even from that that the sub on your basses have a lot more movement because they're it's moving along with everything else that you're doing. Whereas my sub bass is just like, brrr, just flat. Mm -hmm. So I guess both work. For this, I was just trying to make sure that my sub bass was just kind of going by ear really from doing stuff like that. And just making sure that whenever my sub bass plays, it's as strong as the bottom end of your bass is, really. But th th yeah, that's it. And like, there's like a faster version. And so sometimes I'll go into massive and if I need it to kind of come in a little bit later, I'll just drag in a little bit of attack or actually do multiple sub bass layers for like one that's kind of more wobby and one that's more just like mm -hmm. a straight line. Yeah, all I needed on this one was just the same, but with quarter note side chaining for the second drop. But that's basically it. I keep it really simple on the sub bass. Do you ever use sends? No. No. Okay. I just, I don't like them. I mean, it's the <laughs> same thing was like, I don't like anything being hidden. Yeah. Well, I like hiding stuff away I don't want to see, mm -hmm. but everything here, I can tell what it's doing. If I want to know what effects are on something, I can just click on here and go, oh yeah, I can see what's going on. But if I'm sending it and I'm sending from multiple like different channels to like a reverb or something, it's in a different universe again. And mm -hmm. I'm like, what if I wanted to cut the reverb tail off one of these things, but not the other? Yeah. Yep. then eh. totally get that yeah i like everything be to be as simplified and just comfortable as possible <laughs> and it tends to work and if, if i want to apply the same reverb from one thing to another you know i'll just demonstrate with this i would just like copy this to my master channel go to whatever i wanted to apply that to and then just copy it over oh. <laughs> so it's it's just like a little shortcut to getting one effect instead of like opening up this and going okay where's oh. it dude i used to do that so much it would i would like drag across like a hundred tracks and like not even know where i'm trying <laughs> yeah. to drag it to <laughs> yeah because you would need i mean this thing is tall so like that's as far up as i can get and like yeah if i was wanting to drag this to the end of the thing. And also you gotta get really close to here. <laughs> and then you gotta do this. And if you go too far, you'll open like a new desktop on Mac as well. Like <laughs> it's just a bad time. So th these are just like these weird little hacks I've just picked up from using Logic for way too long. <laughs> oh, and the, the master was done by Austin, so I have no idea what <laughs> he did for that. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I can't tell you. This was before I started mastering within the project. I used to finish something and mixed it exactly how I wanted it, export it out and master it in a different project. But now I'm actually applying mastering as I'm going so that I can hear what the final product sounds like the entire way through. And it makes it easier to kind of tweak bits and pieces as I go. It's just one of those things that like I went to university for music production and they were like, you should never do that because then you'll mess it all up. And I'm like, well... And it's taken me years to like go back to that and go, yeah, actually, why not though? Why not? If I know that it's going to sound like that at the end, then yeah. That's funny because that's what I tell a lot of students. I tell them, don't do that. Yeah, but yeah. I think the difference though is it's important to know. I think a lot of times people will throw a bunch of stuff like a multiband compressor and limiter, saturator, whatever on the master chain and they're mixing, but they're not actually mindful of what it's doing. So they could have, yeah. you know, some sounds stupid loud and it's just running into the master effects. And then when they turn it off, then it, it doesn't sound good at all. I think it's important yeah. if you're going to do that to, first of all, be mindful of how your sounds could be processed on the master effects and, you know, A, B it a lot. Yeah, that's generally what I do to make sure, because like you can boost the transients and it sounds great through the master, but then you'll take the master off and it's horrible yeah yeah so i do a lot of abing with that and generally all i have on the mastering chain at the moment is like just one maximizer at the mm. general level that i would master the track at and then i can sort of lean into the saturation of that a little bit more comfortably and mm. yeah but i mean both techniques work it is the riskier thing because you could be making mixing decisions that are actually detrimental to what you're going for yeah you just got to be super super wary of that definitely for beginners I wouldn't suggest doing that. I totally agree with that. Yeah. With beginners, when you're still learning how to mix and stuff, you don't want to 
you know, paint a picture in blue light. Exactly. Even though you're going to like put a blue filter on it at the end. I don't know if that's a good analogy, but basically, yeah, I it's think like that you, works. Should, yeah. you should learn what it is you're actually doing. You should learn what each tool and mixing effect is actually doing mm. and, and do it the right way. So that in the end, when you apply master effects and stuff, then it sounds good. It's more predictable too. Exactly. I think I've seen somebody do that recently on YouTube where they were like painting or uh, making artwork in Photoshop entirely in black and white. I saw a thumbnail of that, actually, yeah. Yeah, they didn't know what colors they were using, and they were like, well, it looks good in black and white. Let's turn the black and white off. And then it's just like mad, yeah. crazy colors. Yeah, so got to be careful. <laughs> Dot Nation, I need to... I caught that. Wow, that was great. Anyways, I feel very compelled to remind you that there is a free sample pack waiting for you down in the description. This sample pack is made from some of the sounds that AU5 made for Voidwalkers. So if you want that free sample pack, literally link down in the description or head on over to donation.net slash Voidwalkers. And again, if you want to see AU5's contribution to Voidwalkers, link down in the description for the School of Bass. But Donation, we are not finished here, not even kind of. You have some homework. I have some stuff for you to do. If you enjoyed this episode, then you are going to love the episode that we did with AU5 where he breaks down his song, The Way to Infinity. And yes, there is a free pack over there for you as well. So if you want to check that out, link down down in the description as always, or you can head on over to donation.net slash TWTI, the way to infinity. Yeah, that's right. That, that makes sense. So we'll see you over there.